Hello, good afternoon. My name is Philip Preston and I would like to welcome you to today's Webinar Express, Know Your Customer, hosted by CIM East of England. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate. Presentation will last for approximately 30 minutes, followed by a short five to 10 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the Ask a Question chat box in the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we are using the hashtag CIM events. The webinar has been recorded and we will share a link to the recording with you over the next few days. You'll also be emailed a short feedback survey after the event, which we'd love you to complete. It'll only take a few minutes. All survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. OK, I'd now like to hand over to Ian Miller from Crafted, who is our guest speaker today. Thank you much, Phil. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for taking some of your time out of your day um, to come and to, to listen to the webinar and hopefully um, learn a few, few things that may be able to be helpful to you um, as you're navigating these times. Very brief introduction. Um, this is me. I'm CEO of Crafted, a full service digital agency. In terms of uh, how I look, the hair's shorter and the beard's longer um, because of COVID, but we are um, obviously uh, as an agency. It suits. So what do we do? Um, why am I here um, as an agency? Um, there's just coming up 65 of us um, as a agency we function across four disciplines so whether that's strategy marketing design and technology it's really about the mix of those things and what i'm going to cover today around how you can better understand your customer will it applies to all of these but certainly um when it comes to sort of the times that we're in at the moment quite often people are asking us more around sort of how it works for marketing in terms of what we do and how we do it, um, as an agency, we are obviously focused very much in terms of um, you know, large scale projects. We're looking at how we can be helping people and you know, our, our size scaling capability. In terms of who we help, it is very, very different. It's whether it's um, large international organizations, medicines from Frontier, um, smaller uh, independents, but really what it, really comes down to is people trying to say I've got some customers what how can I talk to them better how can I interact with them better and what can I get uh, more out of the activity that I'm doing so it's enough about me um wanting to give a little bit of a background just about what I'm going to cover and the one thing that I want you to hopefully take away from this isn't and I'll be going through some of the tools but it's not about thinking oh this tool will revolutionize what I know about customer what I'm hoping that you take away from this talk is actually a bit of about a different way of thinking and how that can happen. So I'm going to try something. I, try, I usually do this in face-to-face uh, -face, uh, um, presentations, but hopefully it may or may not work on a webinar. But, um, let's see how it goes. If you had this uh, stick of sugar from whatever your uh, chosen favourite coffee shop of choice is, if you were to hold it up in front of you, if you were having that as though you just picked it up out of the um, bucket or whatever, and you're about to open it, what would you do? What action would you do? And if this was in front of you, would you just rip the top off? Well, actually, the first thing we all do is we shake it. We make sure that that sugar is you know, not, so when we do open it, it doesn't go everywhere. And that's one of those things where, as an assumption, we just think, oh, we know how to open, obviously, the most benign of things, a, a stick of sugar. But actually, when you take sort of almost like a data-led approach and you just observe, actually how people open it is that they shake it um, first. And when it comes to things in digital, that's one of those things that sometimes happens is that people just think, well, I know how my customers behave. I know what they do. Whereas when you actually use some of the sort of um, techniques and things objectively, you can see perhaps it might be slightly different. When we talk about knowing your customer, a lot of companies or organizations they go down the persona route which absolutely has value this is the example from the national archives they have got you know they've given each of their personas a name they've sort of said what they're typically are in terms of demographic what they're interested in what all the different platforms they may be one of the problems with this is they're quite often incredibly detailed and 
arguably in my mind sort of slightly too detailed very possibly but what they don't do is they're very how often when companies do these personas do they revisit them do they revisit them every three months do they revisit them every year quite often it's sort of you know the next time they do a web build it's three or five years between actually reviewing them and the other thing being is you know, we've got organizations that have got millions of visits a month if you are trying to distill that down into you know there's five people or eight people or however many people you have as your core personas what you can miss is those is those edge cases and increasingly now people are um, wanting to take their own path through digital experiences so doing this persona work absolutely has a level of value especially if perhaps you're not quite so certain just by going through the process it has value but it can also mean that you you have two strong opinions and this is really where um, quotes like this come in it's about having strong opinions but make sure they're weekly held so you have very strong opinions about who your customers are what they do how they um, behave what they act but as soon as data or as soon as um, something challenges that that you're listening to it too often um, especially perhaps at sort of more enterprise level people just go people will say I have a very strong opinion of my customer and it's very strongly held and it takes quite a lot to to change things in terms of the times that we're in at the moment um, obviously with things moving fast in many different industries you need to have weekly held um, opinions. You need to be able to take a look at something and go, actually, we need to um, review this and do something differently. What am I not going to cover today? There's a few things. One is, as an agency, we have access to all sorts of you know, premium paid tools and, and paid data sources that give some level of this information. I'm not going to cover those because I appreciate across the wide range of uh, marketers some people have that budget, some people have access, some people are um, doing it in a different way. What I'm not going to do is go, this is the tool that um, gives you all that information. And because it doesn't, it doesn't. What I am going to cover is about saying, here's how you can self serve some information. Here's how you can look at things without trying to just immediately go, oh, budget equals um, output. So what I'm also not going to cover too, too strong is about sort of some of the things around psychology and sort of on-site um, analytics. Uh, they, it's about trying to say what are the tools and tricks that you can do and just and really a viewpoint. If you come away from this talk with anything, I hope you come across, uh, come away with a view that you'll just say, actually, I can think a bit differently about um, things now. So in terms of how you understand your customers better, what does it really come to? And it comes down to understanding what they care about. Now, when you talk about personas, quite often it's who they are, but who they are isn't necessarily two people who are identical. Um, they care about the same things. So whether that is that they're the same age, so you think, oh, because they're a certain age, they must equal a certain type of person. Whereas what they care about should be common. So if they have interests, etc., then you should you should understand what they care about first, not just who they are. So. This is sort of true for so many our customers lives and people that you wish to be part of um, and talk to. They have they have their whole lives. They have everything that they, they're interested in, everything that they're um, thinking about. And the bit that is going to interface with your business or your organization is actually a sliver. And what you might be talking about as a business or organization doesn't always even match that. And you know we've seen that in terms of the um self-congratulatory press releases that are brilliant to uh, straight people's ego but you know, you know the customer's like well does it really does it affect me it doesn't and when you're looking at this and you're looking and you're saying what are the two things around what your customers are interested in and what your business is interested in and where does that match one area that it always seems to fall down and you know i'm sure will resonate with some is about where businesses are talking about features versus benefits so here's an example white goods are awful for this um you know big uh, is it print ad you know nine kilogram washing machine six kilogram drying capacity I have never weighed my any washing in my life I have absolutely no idea what that means is that you know four pairs of jeans three sweatshirts what is what does it actually mean but as a business they have a product that has features they've got a product that's got a capacity so that's what they've led with whereas if you're using a washing machine you care about can I do one load for a family of three or four that's what you care about they also overstate things in terms of here's on the same ad. You've got four different um, di different variants. The only difference is they're a different color. No feature differences. So why take up that space with talking to people about you know, exactly the same thing across all four of them?
when the only difference is what's the colour and will it match wherever whatever room it's going in. So how do you get some of that understanding? So the first thing that I would think is is who are they in 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 sort of um, top line terms? And the single best way of doing that is actually using Facebook audience insights. It's primarily through the ads side of things. You may not run Facebook ads, but you can upload your audiences and get the insights from that. So this will be things where what you're doing is you're uploading predominantly email lists. What Facebook does is it then matches that against known Facebook accounts. It does, there's no PII um, shared, but what it does is it then says within the group, and if you've got you've got 20,000 customers, it will have a match rate, and of those customers that it matches, it will tell you things like is it over-indexed male to female? Is it a certain age? Is it a location? What are some of those traits? Now the thing here is even if you have zero budget and you're not doing any Facebook ads, you can still get this information. You can still have these audience insights. You can do some of them through people who like your page, but actually when you're uploading and creating Facebook audiences, it's a really nice way of getting some sort of top level um, information. I wouldn't personally group them immediately down into sort of individual personas, but it gives you that feeling of actually perhaps is it different? And the thing there is compare different audiences. So. If you're e-commerce, do you have a VIP audience that are repeat purchasers, they're high value, great um, lifetime value, just put, upload those. So that might be a thousand of your 20,000. Just upload those. How do they look different to perhaps people that always purchase from you in a sale? So take you know, your CRM data, take your customer data. If you have that group, then you can upload those and say, actually, somebody who is going to purchase from me in a sale might look different to somebody who's going to be my high lifetime value. That allows you to then just think, not just obviously about face, Facebook and Facebook ads, um, but it just allows you to then look at all your other strategies and whether that, that resonates. The next thing is about what are they looking for? Now, anybody that says, oh, what are they looking for online? Most people will start and sometimes finish, but um, start at Keyword Planner. It's again, Google Ads tools. Um, the numbers can quite often be effectively made up. They're not um, terribly accurate in and of themselves, but they do give you quite reasonable relative information. So something, if they say something has a thousand searches a month and something that has 10,000 searches, it's probably the reasonable um, order of magnitude difference. It does give you an element of um, time based and trend over time. It's not perfect. It's good for some obvious things like Black Friday or Christmas. But some of the um, things which might change in intent over time, so that might be when people book a holiday because they might look in a certain month, but they might book in a different month. It can be a bit willy, but it's an OK start. And when companies and organisations are using Keyword Planner and agencies, quite often you know, we're going to do some keyword research. It, it may well start with some of this information, but it's worth understanding how that search demand really looks like. So here's an example where when you're looking at search demand, quite often people's, you know, what's the highest search for phrase? What am I wanting to go for? Notwithstanding, obviously, issues of competition around that. Actually, what does that really mean? And when you've got the types of search terms that are on the left, which have got huge um, monthly search volumes, actually quite often they are relatively navigational queries. For a long time, the highest um, search for term on Google was Facebook because people just didn't put .com in the address bar. But that's not going to be something you can come into that conversation. That person is looking for something. They just aren't as, uh, they're, they're lazy and they, that's what they, how they want to do it. Therefore, when you are looking at a topic that you're in, then you know, you're needing to think actually that we've got this sort of fat middle of Key, search volume which have got keywords that have got a decent amount of search volume and there's sort of quite a lot of them and then you do have obviously I'm sure everybody's heard that kind of long tail of searches which are incredibly um, arbitrary um, there was a stat which I think still holds true that hasn't been updated for a couple of years now is 15% of searches every day on Google are new because there's a news event or there's something so they're not repetitive they're not completely repetitive but the point being is people will, there'll just be this millions and millions of um, you know, long tail search volumes. I just wanted to sort of look at this and give you an example. So if you look at um, take weight loss as, a, as an example, as a sort of if you're doing keyword research, there's a few things in this that this shows. So one is actually shorter terms don't always just equal higher search volume. 
quite often people might think, you know, what's the shortest term? One or two keywords must mean um, it's a higher search volume and it isn't quite often. So in here, how to lose weight has a higher search volume three times lose weight. So if you're not doing this and just trying to understand what that search volume is, you're going to miss out and you might be using assumption rather than some data. Keyword planner, et cetera, these data, data points are good, um, but how can you sort of use other third party ones to just sort of validate them? One um, resource that is quite often overlooked um, is actually Wikipedia. So Wikipedia give you, um, and the Wikimedia Foundation Labs, they give you historical data about page views for any of their um, pages. So obviously Wikipedia ranks incredibly highly for a vast number of search terms. There's relatively few verticals where Wikipedia doesn't have any representation. To give you an example, we work with the British Library. And so obviously we can use Wikipedia to talk about relative um, search volumes and relative interest in lots of different authors because the author page for Wikipedia ranks quite well, so therefore it's a good um, proxy. Here you can see distinct spikes around Stephen King. Actually, it's nothing to do with him as an author, it's to do with the um, release of the IT films. Those are ways where you can try and say, oh, actually, because something's happened, I can see the impact. The other thing that the labs tool does is it gives you more information. It doesn't do it's not easy to extract for everything. And um, we've got a tool in house that we can extract or mass all the page views um, from the previous slide. But on this, one of the things they do do, and especially if you're any sort of entertainment or so, um, it can also give you some information around not just the number of page views, but things like the number of edits. Is it something that is very topical? People are talking about it and obviously edits on Wikipedia will happen if it's like a news event. But also the interesting one is the percentage of mobile traffic. Is it something that is people are second screening um, when they're watching something and obviously things around uh, series or um, films that quite often happens. But is your industry or is your topic that your business or organisation is involved in? If you can use this Wikipedia and something go, actually, you know, a really high percentage is mobile. Maybe that would change your strategy around how you talk to them, what the landing page experience is, what you're trying to learn from them. If you've ever done this, um, answer the public. Um, there's a free and a paid um, version. The free version is absolutely um, fine if you just want to get an initial starter for 10. But what that does is it, you give it a topic. I, in this case, it's river cruises. And it gives you the questions people are asking. So when I come back to what are people care about, it's not just who they are and are you the Miriam or um, whatever in the persona, but what are they trying to find? What's the thing that they care about? So if you're in travel, um, take river cruises, that might be things around you know, what actually happens, how long will I be on the boat, what do I need to take, what do I wear, how, what's the um, length of stay, questions which you might as being in the industry just assume people know but they perhaps don't and they want that comfort and they want that ability to not look stupid um, when they turn up and um, we have it in sort of luxury goods with some, um, some of the high-end clients we have and actually by making sure people are answering those questions everybody is in the luxury sector everybody is a customer for the first time so are they getting that information that's just breaking down that barrier to going actually do you know what? I'm going to spend my um, money at this level of uh, you know, product and purchase so answer the public is really good as a way of sort of starting that visualization of what people are searching for that have those kind of Q&A and obviously from a content point of view allows you to um, match your content with with what people are searching for also ask.com is a another free tool it gives you the ability you put in search terms now people are probably familiar you put in a search term and there's now there's a people also asked box paa box where it's sort of an accordion and it shows for the topic that you search for quite often what are some similar similar topics this tool basically goes through that and says you know if you were to ask that question and you go on to the next one you can see some threads of um what that happens certainly if you do it at the moment you know, you're seeing um a prominence of things such as online and think people wanting to do things digitally so how do i how do i book online what, how can i um, do something online etc so this is a good tool um 
do find that sometimes, and I think this is actually more a problem of Google, is that uh, if you look two or three levels deep without resetting um, the information, it starts getting a little bit sort of US centric. So depending on where in the world you are and your organization operates, perhaps it may be more or less relevant. But it's a brilliant just way of just starting to think about how these things um, work and put themselves together. One of the things, and you know, we are in changing times um, for all marketers, uh, it's about saying how do, how do things change over time? Absolutely the first port of call for nearly everybody will be Google Trends. Um, this is one of my uh, sort of favorite examples of where what we're looking at, we don't want to plan ahead for what we're doing on the weekend. It's very immediate, things to do near me rather than um, this weekend. But actually it can also give you a way of trying to understand not just you know, is something more popular than something else? But are we changing behaviours? Very few you know, people don't live in a flat anymore. They're marketed as apartments. So if if you are a company that's still marketing flats, but you know, obviously people are looking for apartments, you're going to have that mismatch. And if you, you can use Google, Google Trends, not just for the what's happening today, and there's some absolutely interesting things there. But what you're really trying to do is say, is my market moving away from me? Is it moving for, for me? So at the moment there's a lot of if you are doing this in your market then there's a lot of things around people wanting more flexibility whether that's in their work environment whether it's in the lease on their office like they're looking for flexibility and they're looking for things because there's, there's a level of uncertainty so you, if you look at that trend you can see it may not be that there's an overall increase of search volume in a topic but it's just changing within what people are doing Another thing to think about, and this is really where you need to look at your own old data. Um, this is an example for a client. They were launching a product. They were getting lots of information um, out there and they're getting lots of, lots of uh, sort of you know, talk about it. But even though they were getting clicks, you know, until that product was near a launch, they really weren't going to um, purchase. And what this is, is you might know your customer's interested in it. You've got a product that matches what they're searching for. But until you actually get to the point of perhaps being able to push that button or they feel it's real, then they may well not actually be in that place. But if you have got a full spectrum strategy, they may be people that are perhaps two or three months um, ahead of themselves. They're in that remarketing list. They're in that um, social uh, ads that are you've got those audiences set up. So when something does come online, an example where this really plays out we see is uh, within property or in travel where quite often they trail things like new for 2021 um, but the photos are quite clearly stock. That's where we find that they might the business might be saying that we've got this it's new for next year we need to get people interested in it but actually until perhaps more things like stock photography are replaced with real and something that people think is more meaningful there's not that um, interaction. If there was one thing that I think is unused as much as it really should be and in terms of information about your own customers for most organizations it's about site search. Um, site search you can track it in analytics, um, depending on how you do it, but basically you can track it in analytics you, which I'll go into in a minute. But if you nail site search you've really got to take a step back and say what is somebody doing a site search who are they? They're engaged enough to bother, which is one thing. They're not just aimlessly clicking. I can't really see anything I like. I'm just clicking on. So they're engaged enough to bother. They're also their onward journey needs to be as clean as possible, because if they maybe have clicked three or four pages, they haven't found what they wanted. The navigation isn't clear and then they're using site search. If you don't have a really good site search response afterwards, where literally you're showing them what they're wanting, I think Oliver Bonner's do it really, really well they will then have a, a bad response because you know they're investing in you by all of us you know our attention spans are, are in measured in seconds not no more so if you are getting somebody who's on your site and they're invested if you take those terms and you are doing site search terms um, monitoring and analytics you can get some really good insight out, out of the information that you had so here's an example for a client and you know in a week they had 211 um, transactions that was you know, strongly because people are doing a site search 21% e-commerce conversion rate that's brilliant but that also is a red flag that perhaps that product or what they were searching for isn't high enough in the hierarchy it isn't visible enough isn't it's not obvious enough 
because people who use site search are taking that time to do that search so they're, they're invested enough however what about those people that just clicked a category can see the thing they thought should be in there and but you know they, they just click away you've also got things that you can then um, look at in things such as average order value so you know further down the page you've got things that have got how um how it's much people are paying in terms of average order value if they're doing that search so if you've got people who are perhaps 20 30 40 percent higher average order values if they do a certain search you really want to be caretaking them really really strongly so can you do things like um can the site search be uh, narrowed down so it forces if somebody does a certain search it lands them directly to the page rather than even a search page just to um, shorten that journey you need to be looking at site search if you have it and is is a um, thing about how do you know your customer you know they're already on your site and if they're trying to find something and you're not listening to that you're always going to have a little bit of a mismatch another thing to think about is like actually how do they convert and one of the first things because you know i've talked about some things that are e-commerce talked about things that are obviously very online but a lot of businesses aren't a lot of businesses are lead gen they're trying to get people into a sales funnel we've got clients especially in sort of legal sectors and some commercial sectors where they might be nine to 18 months lead time from an initial lead through to a transaction if you were to say what what did my ads do today without knowing what that lead source was all the way through you're missing the trick so if you can that is about working with your agency or internal teams to say have we got a um, crm have we got something um, that gives us either a single customer view or gives us the ability to push through not just what that first interaction was but perhaps more follow-ups um, and how we can do that end to end so there's other things that you can do there we on paid search you can do um, footfall uh, activity that will determine yes it's digital activity but you can then have that offline uh, outputs of somebody walking into store you can also look at marrying up from a uh, audience data so while i've talked about facebook audiences obviously you know if a bit more enterprise you might have something like a metria or something that has got more in information there but how does you do you get into that perhaps this online transaction which might be quite easy and perhaps the offline transaction which isn't are you tracking phone calls um in order to be able to show the perhaps active marketing activity it drove phone calls even if it didn't um drive online activity and one of the last ways it's uh it's like me um driving not asking for directions but it is just about asking it is about saying you know I don't know and too many businesses don't actually just go out and ask so google consumer surveys um are really strong really easy really cheap relatively there you know for a couple of three thousand pounds you can ask a lot of questions from a lot of people that will give you really good insight that you just wouldn't know otherwise um for those that do know quite often things like and um, this is an example one but newspapers might use it as a bit of a paywall to get access to content um, you also find it in some apps, um, just as obviously it's a monetization for the app, but the user gets asked a question. They're super customizable, they're really quick. You can define your audience down to basically the Google audiences, so whether that's age, demographics, um, tech, et cetera. But we've used it from everything from asking people about if you saw a product with this name would you think it's an x y or a z um we've used we've used it to get information that we've then later used for pr pieces so 46 percent of people think x or y the point about survey, the surveys is if you think i wish i knew this question then you can just dive into consumer surveys set up a survey and get some information back and especially in this piece you're trying to get the information for the um for the business to move on if you're not doing um on-site information um i would really recommend you look at it hotjar um we use extensively ask people questions to give you an example of how we've used this is client in finance and credit um credit cards they we used hotjar on their conversion page um it was why would you not sign up you know what is preventing you from signing up and when we asked those questions, there was a trend for people to say about how they wanted to know more about the fees. They wanted to know more about what it might cost them. And the thing here is 
actually most businesses, especially financial, they're like, they'll hide that. We'll put that behind something like, is, you know, don't really want to be too upfront about that. Whereas actually that was what people wanted. So we, we changed the page, put fees front and center and actually conversion rate went really, really strongly. So if you ask people, literally just ask them, is there something else on this page that would be helpful to you? You will get an answer. You won't get an answer from everybody, but you will get some. There's a few times it goes wrong um, and just sort of finishing up because obviously it's all great with this, but I love this quote. It's what it claims to be, but it's not what I expected it to be. If you are going out there and you're putting yourself out there as something and therefore you raise an expectation, even if underneath there's like, you know, there's asterisks and there's that caveat of it may or may not be doing something else, you aren't going to have that match with the customer experience. And it's actually trying to say, what does my customer expect of my product or my service? Because that's that's what counts. It's not actually whether you claim it does or doesn't do something. It's what they expect it to do. And if you can use some of these tools and thought processes, to just go, I'm just going to ask that question. I'm just going to get that bit of information. Then that is you know, how you um, will get it. Obviously, there's an awful lot of um, information that you could get from all of these different tools and obviously the paid ones that we would have access to as an agency or any other um, sources because there are a lot and I only have half an hour. But the point is, is that you know, knowledge is that tomato is a fruit, whereas wisdom is that you don't put it in a fruit salad. If you are getting all this information, you still need to have a view on it and go, actually, that just doesn't ring true. I need to question that. I need to think. You know, strong opinions, but weekly held. Look at something. And go. Do you know what? This doesn't make sense that somebody's doing that. So it is about having that difference between the knowledge and the data, because that is actually quite easy to get, and you can almost drown in it. To just having that wisdom and saying, I need to take a step back, and what does it really tell me? So I'm going to leave you before we get into Q and A, um, just with one thought, and I think it really applies to where we're at at the moment in sort of the wider world. And that is that obviously. In this environment, it is really easy to say everything's new, and it is in many cases. And there's lots of things that um, people are responding to. I know the last webinar went through quite a bit of that um, in more detail about some of the sort of trends. But one of the things is is that quite often we see is do you know what? In another three or four months, people are just going to go back to what they were doing, and you know, the Outlook um, calendar thing will pop up on a Friday saying need to send out newsletter. If you're going through that, if it is just this crank the handle marketing where you know this day I'm doing this for half an hour, this day I'm doing that for an hour, it is you could there's loads of information out there. You can go and do this for your own site and your own customers and get, I would hope, lots of kind of aha moments. But actually the difficulty of applying it isn't isn't that it's about saying this is this is something I'm going to pursue and then moving away from perhaps something you did before. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that that gave you some ideas and some tools, but some um, thought processes that are beneficial to you. Um, before we just get into the Q&A, we're going to be following up with a um, sort of more in-depth piece on this. So we'll be able to send that out. Um, please do get in touch if there's any um, questions, obviously, depending on how many you receive, we'll just try and respond to those in more kind of sort of in themes. Um, but yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Ian. Obviously, there's some um, no shortage of uh, really good analytics and information out there. So um, we're now going to have a short uh, Q&A session. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. So uh, first of all, Ian, there was a couple of questions around uh, Facebook audience insights. Uh, one was uh, actually, how do you upload uh, data? Uh, to um, to that system, um, and the other question was around GDPR. Are there any GDPR implications because you're obviously trying to you're processing people's uh, personal data, including email addresses? So. so, in terms of how you do it, it is um, as you go through the Facebook um, ads or business um, inf interface, then you you have the option to basically upload an audience. What actually happens is you don't actually upload the data what happens is that um, locally it gets hashed out and then the hash is what um, get Facebook use in terms of GDPR then it would depend on your own businesses view and what you have um, so whether as 
in B2B, quite often it's sort of legitimate interest. There's um, PECA legislation as well, but they, they take a view that um, quite often that's okay under the sort of legitimate interest because they are, you obviously don't get that information unless somebody is already a customer. Um, so for most of our customers, obviously that's been permissioned during the process of um, actually getting the um, information. So we have um, obviously permissioned databases. So it will depend, there is an, as that is an it depends one. Um, obviously, please don't just go out and sort of scrape large amounts of uh, email lists and, and sort of you know, use them nefariously. But if you have got a robust uh, data um, strategy and you know what, what your information is, we haven't had, um, obviously we've got you know, massive organisations as clients and even going through that with all of their legal teams, as long as they have their house in order, they've been fine with it. Okay, great. Um, there's a couple of people asking, um, are these tools free? I think um, they are, aren't they? I think you said yes. at the start there are some paid versions. but all the Yeah, there's all of these, a couple of them have got a paid version of that tool, but I've tried to do things where you can basically do all this yourself. So go to also ask, go to answer the public, put in a search term that's relevant for you and you'll start getting information. Um, the one thing that's slightly different is the keyword planner that you need to have an ads account that um, you're running against, but you don't actually have to have live ads. So there's some that are kind of got an Facebook um, audience is, is similar. You've kind of got a little bit of barrier to entry, but there's an element of sort of signing up and but not putting a credit card in. Um, but yeah, in terms of this, I, I deliberately haven't focused on the more kind of, you know, premium um, enterprise tools. OK, great. OK. Um, Next question, I don't understand, but I'm sure you will, Ian. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully. Do you have the ability to target second screeners in real time? Um, it, it depends. Um, you can do so. We uh, have got, so to give an example, um, we work with Medicine Sans Frontier. They have their um, main campaigns. They will have as part of their campaigns, um, obviously TV advertising, so we run campaigns and have certain um, tools and things that allow us to optimise based on people who are at the same time watching an ad on the Channel 4 News. So therefore, that may either be blanket coverage of search results. So if there's, there, it's the sort of thing that you may have um, a timeliness to um, something, you know when it's going to happen. So you then just flood the market in a shorter space of time. Um, that starts getting into more sort of complicated you know display programmatic um situations but yes broadly um it's mainly kind of you're thinking why why are they second screen are they just are they are they doing general research while they happen to be watching tv or is it because they're watching a travel program on tv that you know is going to france and you're a french um, travel company that you want to be doing ads relative to that so there's there's the different ways that you can do it but yeah you can there's there's absolutely yeah, or ability to do it okay great um there's one or two questions around um sort of market research if you like so um this is quite a lengthy one but it's quite specific but uh here we go what's what's the better way of approaching a particular target segment if i want to do market research i'll tell you my current experience i need to know more about chefs purchase behavior in australia i'm not australian and I would like right. to interview them. So I've joined some Facebook groups. What would you advise me to start this contact? Um, that is quite specific, chefs in Australia. Um, but I'm sure you know, the principle applies to others. I think they're starting the right way, um, joining some Facebook groups, uh, depending on perhaps not with chefs, LinkedIn groups can be quite good. Um, and for a couple of clients, we've actually started LinkedIn groups where they've almost got like user groups. So, or, or Facebook groups. So actually you're trying to, have something that is an engaged audience for what you're doing. Um, in terms of targeting, you would then look at also, again, you're trying to go back right to the very beginning of what I said about what they're interested in. So are they watching, I don't know, certain YouTube channels? Are they watching certain things? And in terms of some of the you know, digital ad inventory, you can target people that are watching things. Where you've got a layered audience, so you they have to A, be in Australia, they then have to B, be a chef and presumably C, have some kind of interest in whatever the product is. It won't be perfect, but what you can do, it's a slide I actually took out, 
is if you layer all of your different audiences from an ad point of view or from a, a research, you can then entice them. If you're trying to talk to them, just be genuine. Quite often we've had it where you just literally say, look, I need 15 minutes of your time. I'll give you a 50 pound Amazon voucher. I need to ask you 10 questions. Have you got it? Twitter's really good for outreach in that because it's quite personal. It's quite um, you know, one-to-one. Um, so you know, doing Twitter searches, finding the right people. Blogs, um, again, various searches you can do. There's tools such as Buzzsumo and things, but there's searches you can do sort of about, is there a blog that happens to be from a um, chef? Again, just approach them. The thing with some of the tools, so if you take you know, a YouGov survey or a, a, um, is a more premium member um, or Mori or some, something there, I mean, you're spending thousands, whereas you could be quite guerrilla about it, get an audience of 10 or 15 people that you've just literally reached out to, paid 50 pound Amazon voucher to them that is useful for them and they'll give you they'll talk to you and quite often if you're if you're just honest about it we get a really good response rate. Okay great um do you have any online tools such as also ask that are particularly good for b2b rather than b2c? Ah, the the difference um I would say the I have a bit of a Thing about this is b2b to b2c is increasingly a blurred line and still you are trying to even if you're in a b2b environment there's obviously you know abm and things where people view it as a very b2b focused approach however actually you're still talking to a person and your sales or marketing is still probably coming from a person so you still really got to think what makes that person look good quite often to their um, you know, superiors or um, reports. What makes them um, shine? To give you an example, we did a piece. It was a company that sells um, software to sort of mid market companies, about 2000 staff. And the best piece of content that was performed for years was literally it was a two page PDF that was a finance director's guide to buying this piece of software. And all it was was a series of questions. So when they did the RFP and they went out and they got um, lots of different options, they could just look OK by these are the questions of do you have this feature, this feature and this feature? Obviously, our client could answer yes to it. So that's good. But again, you're really just trying to focus on what makes somebody not look bad. So when we do use a um, uh, you know, answer the public or any of those, you, you still find that people will ask quite similar questions and sometimes depending on what you're selling B2B, the person looking may be more junior that has been sent out to get a shortlist and they're passing it on to somebody else. So actually there might be quite a lot of research at quite a more junior end, even if it's quite a um, considered purchase that might need C-suite approval. Actually, sometimes the initial gatekeeper might be quite junior or they might be in procurement who don't really know the first thing about something. So they, are, they start Googling about so I would still use those. I wouldn't just avoid sort of answer the public. I know obviously the name implies that it's um, more B2C, but if you put in even some B2B topics, you will, you will still get information. And then the other thing is still site search. If you do have a B2B site, I would still recommend if possible, you know, if it's big enough, the site search, and then you can start saying, oh, okay, that's what they're asking. That's what that's for. Great. Um, and I've got a couple more questions. Um, First one is, if I want to find out what kind of search terms are being used by a competitor's site, which ranks higher in search results, what is the best ideally free tool to you? Um, some of the ones that are paid, so things like SEM Rush Search Metrics, PI Data Metrics, etc., that um, we've got access to, they will tell you. So if you've got a friendly agency, then they can probably give you that um, report. Um, another thing is is actually just um, looking at their page. So if they if you look at the page for their product or service that's equivalent to yours and actually think what have they used in a title tag, what have they used as their main um, header, what have they used as you know the content, are they talking about things a bit too much? There are a few sort of page comparisons and things that will tell you this 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 page is targeting a certain term. They're not perfect. But actually there's no there's honestly no substitute, even for experienced SEOs, of just going to a page saying, they seem to be talking about this, sticking it into Google and seeing what Google thinks and whether they're whether they're ranking for it. So 
if you've got a friendly agency, then you know get them to use some of their paid tools that will do more of a whole of market view. But you can do an element of it is just look there and say, okay, they've got all these pages. You know, do a site map of their pay, their site and say they've got ten pages on this topic. We've got one. They're probably going to be doing better than you because you know that's something they're going after. Okay. Um, finally, then, in um, any specific tools, best practices for modelling future short and long term customer trends? Um, the only constant is change. Um, I think what we see is the best thing about this is if you have got the time, like it's it's do a few of these things, but do them regularly because then you will see what that difference is over time. You'll suddenly see do site search, track it. But you can do comparison because it's in analytics, so you can do comparison. So you can do this last week versus six months ago. You can do what the site search um, output looks like. And then what that can give you is, you know, it might be annual. It might be um, obviously kind of working around um, holidays or um, big events. But it may also just be, do you know what, more people are starting to look at something and maybe I don't have a product or paid or service um, that matches it. So I would in terms of looking future any you know they really aren't there are there are a few that purport to do it but i don't see that they're much better than an educated guess my view would be is spend your time just getting familiar with a few tools that you are comfortable with that you like doing so when something starts happening you can see it in your tool set and you're saying okay right i can this, this feels different to me I, and we can adjust accordingly okay that's great um, thank you very much, Ian. So um, thanks for all the time we have for our Q&A session today. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Ian for today's presentation, to CIM East of England for hosting the event, and a thank you to you for attending. I hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express is on Thursday the 30th of July, again at one o'clock. The topic is driving consumer actions through brand interaction and experiences, this time hosted by CIM Scott. You'll find it listed on the CIM website where you can register for the session if you haven't already done so. And we are adding further Webinar Express events uh, to that uh, events page uh, day by day. Uh, once again, as a reminder, you'll shortly be receiving a survey on today's event, and we would really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So on behalf of CIM, thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.